So this is 31 curves in space and tangents. So for us, space is usually going to be R3, although could be higher dimensions. What's the only thing that requires third dimension, uh, n equals 3? There's only one thing we covered. Cross product. So anytime we do a cross product, you have to be in three dimensions. So this will be curves in space and tangents. So we've seen curves before. A curve in Rn is a function. We'll use alpha for the, no, oh, we use R for the curve. So its domain is going to be R and its range or output will be Rn. And it's going to send some time value or a T parameter to x of t, y of t, z of t. When you think about it like this, it's just a three, this is what it looks like in three dimensions. And of course, if n is two, you don't have a z. And if n is four, you can't use x, y, z anymore. So you have to think of other names for it. But we're most, mostly going to be in three dimensions. So your R of 3, XT, YT, ZT. Sometimes it's better to use IJKs. So you could write it as XTI plus YTJ plus ZTK. We'll look at an example of a spiral. So our x and y coordinates will be cosine and sine, like normal. Now our z coordinate, instead of equaling zero, I'm gonna use t for the z coordinate. So what that means is over time, as t increases, we are also going upwards. We're going up the z-axis. So the x and y are just rotating around unit circle like normal, but our z is increasing as we're going up. So think about a spring, like a slinky, or the spring that flies out of your pen, something like that. We're just going up that spiral. Now how do you graph it? Very carefully, put the x there the y right there, and z going up. Let's think about the orientation that we would get. So when t is zero, I'll use blue for our curve like before. When t is zero, we're going to be here on the positive x-axis. Now which way am I going to go? Back to the right or back to the left? I'll be going back to the right because if I plug in pi over 2, I'll be somewhere above the positive y-axis. So we're going back to the right. However, it's a little more tricky because we're going back to the right as we're going up a little bit as well. So I'm going to attempt to draw one spiral. When I come back, what t-value will I have when I'm above so I want to have the same x, y coordinates. What t value will I have when I have the same x, y coordinates a second time? I'll be at 2 pi higher up. So I'll just draw another. This point has the same x, y coordinates, but the z coordinate will be 2 pi. So now I'm going to try to draw a spiral. And let's see. I think it looks something kind of like that, maybe. So that'll be two spirals. And I'll just draw an arrow. That's good enough. 
So if you really want this to look good, you really need to look at some spring and then hold it at the right perspective and do your best to draw it. Maybe take a picture of it and then trace the picture. It might be the easiest way to do it. But that's about as good as I can do from just thinking about it. So when we're doing calculus, the very, very first thing we learned was, even before derivatives, was limits. So we're going to look at limits here on curves. So these are limits of vectored valued functions. So limit, so our input's t, so limit as t approaches some t naught value. Our function's r of t. There's actually three components. There's x, y, and z component. And we're going to call this l. So l is now going to be a three-dimensional point. There's three components of l. We're going to write the epsilon delta, any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the input t minus t naught is less than epsilon, oops, is less than delta, then r of t minus l is less than epsilon. So I'm going to write down the good old days limit. This is the old epsilon delta definition that, we all remember. that all of you remember. So it says any epsilon greater than zero, I'm just skipping the any and there exists with the upside down A means any or all. Backwards E means there exists delta greater than zero, ST such that if X minus X naught less than delta. So if the inputs are cl as closer than delta, then the outputs, which will be, I'll write down limit, uh, x approaches x naught, fx equals l. Here in this case, l is a number. So that means your output is very close to your limit and is epsilon close. So that should be somewhat familiar. I think we may have used Maybe little lowercase a instead of x naught, but it's very similar. All right, so let's look at our definition and what's really changing. So x changes to t. Are those numbers? Are t minus t naught? Are those numbers? Those are just numbers. We're subtracting, taking absolute value, just like before. So that's exactly the same on the inputs. Now let's look at the outputs. What type of thing is are outputting. It's going to be a vector, usually three dimensions. L is a point in three dimensions, so we're subtracting two points. We're getting a vector. So this whole thing's a vector. What does that mean the absolute or the uh, vertical bars represent? We're actually taking the magnitude of the vector. So written, it's exactly the same. It's just we're doing a magnitude here. That's the only difference. So this is magnitude. And we're comparing the magnitude to a number, which makes sense. With the magnitude, the distance to be small. So that's the definition of a limit. And you can do this one at a time. We'll look at that tomorrow. So you could break it down to just three one-dimensional regular limits.